Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to meet you. I'm so excited to meet you as well. Do we do, is this the time when we should do a little introduction? Is this right now? Ooh. Okay, well, you go first. Thank you. Um, my name is Raha. Uh, you can pronounce that as Raha. Uh, and I am in the director's lab with Paprika this year, 2021 cohort. Um, the digital festival, so it's really exciting, a new innovative way to theater um and yeah i'm excited to meet you great uh well i'm excited to meet you too mostly um my name is rob and i was the artistic producer of the paprika festival and i i'm just going through the dates in my head and i actually think it's 2010 to 2014 maybe it might be 20 like 2009 to 2013 anyway I was the artistic producer for four years um, in and around that time. Uh, and uh, and it was a really thrilling and exciting experience for me um, as an artistic leader. Cool. Were, were you ever a participant as well? Or? I was not, no, because I didn't grow up uh, in Toronto. I grew up in Kingston and I didn't move to Toronto until like 2007. Um, but I have a lot of background uh, and passion for arts education and um, and have worked in arts education alongside my professional career always. So there's always sort of the two sides of it. And so when um, at that time, Julia Lederer was running the festival briefly, and when the job became available, I had already had some intersection with the, the festival and the work that it did. And it seemed like a really clear fit for me to apply. Um, and then it just became like a great love. And I uh, did yeah. it for four seasons and, and loved almost every second of it. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a really, really exciting time. Why, why would you say almost? <laughs> That's a great, you know what? The almost is a really, it's an important part because uh, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of hard work for, uh, at that time, like very little money. And, um, and so not that money drives most of this, obviously we would all be in the wrong careers if that was the case, but, uh, it was more figuring out a way to put paprika in the context that it deserved. I always felt like we could and should be doing more. And I wish that we had had more resources to do the more. And so I think that that's why it was an almost is that there was sometimes that frustration of feeling like we were hitting a ceiling. That's so crazy. Okay, I'm gonna really veer off of these questions. I think. Okay, cool. Where? How do you think? Like, at what point was that paprika? Was that they were already like ten years in? Yeah. Uh, while I was the artistic producer, we actually did the uh, ten year celebration. So we did a big event uh, for the tenth anniversary of the festival. Okay, how do you feel then, this is, this is my question, then. how do you feel Paprika, from what you've done, you know, has grown into a certain way or have, has developed throughout the years? So it's been 10 more years, right? Yeah, crazy. which is, cra it feels totally crazy to me, like totally crazy to me. Um, I think what I've noticed uh, since my time at the festival, and, and I, am proud of a little piece of this is that paprika has really become a better service to the emerging artist community across the city. And so when I began, um, paprika was very firmly entrenched in the Tarragon Theatre, which is where it started. Mm -hmm. And the Tarragon was an amazing home for the first sort of 10 years of the festival. But eventually, I think the festival kind of outgrew it. And so my uh, final year was sort of our exit from the Tarragon intentionally and, and into um, being able to take up residence in a number of different spaces. And the intention there was that if Paprika has physical presence in a multiplicity of spaces throughout the city, then we have a chance to work with a greater diversity of artists, of artists who we perhaps haven't worked with before, and and both participants and mentoring artists that could be connected to that theater's community that we maybe wouldn't have access to otherwise. And so it was really about looking to greater outreach and greater impact across the city rather than sort of in our little bubble of people who we already knew. And so uh, what has been so exciting for me over the last 10 years, which again, feels crazy to say, is watching the festival continue to expand and those roots um, grow deeper and wider. And so for more young artists to be 
um, working in the festival and from those for those artists to come from a, a greater variety of neighborhoods and backgrounds. Wow. That's actually crazy. That's awesome that you were part of that expansion. I think that's really cool because, you know, um, it's like the essence of Paprika is, is to help emerging artists and emerging artists are everywhere. It's hard to place it in a certain spot in Toronto, you know, or yeah. what would have been your favorite part uh, when you mm. were in Paprika? Uh, that's hard to say. I loved so much of it. Um, I, I feel really lucky to have been able to work with the people that I worked with. Um, uh, we had a lot, we had a really amazing executive team and and really amazing uh, mentorship within that team so that as it changed, we actually had a few people from the festival become members of the executive team and you could start to see that happening, which is really exciting. But I think my favorite part was, um, I was really invested in ancillary activities, uh, which was stuff around side the production. So when I began, it was pretty much just productions at Paprika. There wasn't much else. There wasn't the director's lab. None of this other stuff sort of existed. Oh. And we expanded to four programs, I think, at the time. But then during the festival itself, we had this whole separate space. And in this separate space, uh, we had we decorated it and we made it look totally unlike a rehearsal hall. And it was basically like a lobby just for the festival. And we had activities there that would happen before and after each show. Um, those activities were programmed by festival participants um, themselves. And it was a space for creativity uh, and communion, like for artists to come together and chat with one another so that it wasn't just about come to the festival, see some work and then go home. It was about come to the festival and work and then engage with those artists who had made it. And um, uh, that was new during my time. And it was very much the thing that uh, I got really excited about, the ways in which artists were making connections as a result of having a space to do so. So I think that's probably my favorite part. It feels like the greatest uh, impact was had there. That makes a lot of sense because then, you know, you get to discuss it with the creators themselves. It's almost yeah. like, a, like a, you know, a talk back but it's casual we can go up and discuss it with random audience members as well as totally the creators themselves and mingle it. it almost creates like a little ensemble within the audience well it and it it also meant that you know the folks who were in paprika there was a we had an advisory council or an advisory board and what that meant is that the folks from within Paprika who wanted to take on more of a leadership role could do so. And so that, you know, maybe they didn't have a production that year, but they still wanted to play an active role in the festival. Well, they could program the events of this space. We just had this extra room. And so we had, um, you know, like a, like a dance one night and we had like craft night and we had table talk and cards. It was like a weird sort of, um, uh, side of the festival that that I think was a really good compliment to the work that was happening on stage. Wow, I really love that actually, especially yeah, because then people can always also tie back their show with what's going to happen after and before and make it you yeah know, relatable in a way or think about the show in a different. And way. that is exactly what we did. Yeah, we had some live music often before and after. We did have some sort of more formal panels and discussions and that stuff. Um, and uh, and we put it in between matinees and evening shows too. So we had like, it was a really great connecting space. Yeah, I really love that. I wish every single show had something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I really, I think that that kind of stuff is what, I think it's the reason why I, I do theater and why I like theater is for the opportunity to have a shared experience with who I don't know. 100%, bringing people together. I, I understand with that. Um, Oh, like it's it's not the same, you know, if you're doing it on your own, where are you doing it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What would you say some of the things that inspire you to create? Like, do you still, first of all, create and what kind of things do you do? And then how? what are the things that inspire you to do those things? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm a director and a playwright um, and certainly work as an artistic leader as well. And, and I find great value in that kind of work. So I've done a lot of self-producing with my company, Timeshare Performance, but I was also recently named the co-artistic producer of ARC, which is a, an independent company in Toronto. And 
Uh, and I also do a lot of teaching. So I, I teach a lot at uh, post-secondary institutions primarily um, and direct analysis as well. And I, think I saw your workshops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think what I am most inspired by in my work is often the conversation between my artistic practice and my education practice. So I learn a lot from working in a teaching capacity. Um, and I also bring a lot from my professional practice into that teaching. And so those two things sort of parallel lives running beside each other um, have been a really important touchstone to artists and, and certainly have informed it. Um, in terms of like what stuff inspires me is I'm really, I go through phases <laughs> artistically where I like sort of focus on one thing for a few years. Um, and, uh, and I would say that right now I'm really interested in uncovering uh, queerness in theater history and also queerness in contemporary theater. Um, and in particular, the idea of queer stories on stage rather than just queer people telling straight stories on stage. Yeah. Um, so there, there are a ton of examples of work like this from the past and people like this from the past in sort of more mainstream history. And we don't often get to hear their stories and um, and we don't often get to see those theater works that exist already. Um, and so I'm right now artistically sort of diving into to that world and finding out more there. Cool. Um, are you writing something yourself? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm working on a couple of projects right now. I generally have about four things that I'm working on as a writer and various amounts of time is being spent on each of them. Wow. So I have a few on the go right now. And uh, I'm currently one of the Neil Monroe directing uh, program folks at the Shaw Festival. So I'm uh, like assisting on two shows there and doing that, uh, doing some of my queer investigation actually for my director's project that will be there um, mm -hmm. in the fall. So that's my my big ticket item. Always, I always have a bunch of writing projects on the go and they, not surprisingly, always have lots of queers in them. Well, of course, <laughs> you got to represent yourself and try to make sure your identity is being represented as well properly. And yeah. Fully relate with that. Who is like your biggest role model growing up? like artistically yeah i think that could mean also maybe like it doesn't have to be some kind of celebrity it could oh no it wouldn't be i don't know any celebrity. yeah you know it could be just someone you've worked with <laughs> that you've, like always been like fangirling over on the side you know <laughs> yeah i mean there's a lot of those people um fangirl quite a lot and the fun thing about <laughs> canadian theater is that you you meet all those people right so like all of my my people who I would fangirl over, I've already met them, and I, you know, to some degree, have a relationship <laughs> with them, and said something awkward, I'm sure. Um, I think uh, one, I think a, a person who I think is like an incredible artist, um, who's Canadian, who I have long fangirled over, and actually, Wow, Paprika, she was our, um, we sort of used to have these like professional artists um, who were. I forget what we called them, but they were sort of like our host for the festival each year. And it was folks who, who were guest sort of- host, Guest guest host. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And they they were sort of like, they would like um, like come to events and sort of talk about how important the, the work of the festival was. They were kind of like big ticket items anyway. And one of them was uh, Susan Coyne. And Susan Coyne is an artist who I think is uh, absolutely incredible, both as a writer and as a performer. And I think she's a, a real inspirational force uh, in the world. So I love her work. Um, as a writer, I love the work of Michael Healy. I love the work of Linda Griffiths. Um, I love, like I could just name 12 million Canadian playwrights. I just, uh, I read a lot of Canadian plays. I really love, I love Michelle Marc Bouchard. Um, but uh, directorially and in terms of like contemporary sort of stuff, um, I think Philip Aiken is probably, you know, one of the best directors in the country. Um, I am incredibly inspired by Ashley Corcoran, who I would consider a mentor of mine. She's the artistic director uh, of the Arts Club in Vancouver, but she used to be the artistic director at the Thousand Islands Playhouse and I was her associate artistic director there. Um, so I think she's pretty phenomenal human. Um, uh, I'm really inspired by, even though I don't know 
her very well. Gesha, who I think is just absolutely incredible. Um, and what she's doing at Soul Pepper is mind blowing. So lots of, lots of people. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, working with Paprika was good for is helping me meet a whole bunch of the sort of top artists in this sector in, in this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we are so lucky in Toronto, such a vibrant theater industry to have such a vibrant sort of diversity of theater artists and the kinds of stories that are being told in Toronto are really exciting to me. But I also think that in Canada, in general, we are so lucky because um, there is so much investment made into the arts, never enough, obviously, but but so much investment made into the arts so that stories from communities across the country can be shared. And with a country that is this large and this diverse in nature, it's really important that we can share those stories. And I love that. Um, I love Canadian art. I think it's really good. And I, I, I think we are starting to reach the point where people are recognizing that outside of Canada too. Yeah, totally. I agree with you. Um, yeah, it's very unique, the diversity here. I don't think you didn't go anywhere and meet this many cultures in one week. <laughs> no, certainly not. And I think, you know, you see that in the the work because it's not only ethno-specific work, it's about like uh, cultural competency, right? Like having understanding of another place and another and time. intersectionality too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Finding the universality. How can we make this person from a whole different side of the planet? And what, what my story is. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I think is so exciting, particularly right now in Canadian art making. Yeah. Obviously, I've been an artist for a very long time, and you're probably, you know, shifted, as you said, between a lot of different uh, roles. What do you think? has you know made you the artist you are today but is there any moment that kind of shifted for you or changed what you were doing or how you saw what you were doing yeah a few a few things come to mind sure. i think the most important one is probably uh when i was the artistic producer of paprika um i was invited to go to york uh theater royal in england mm. um because they have a festival there that's called the Takeover Festival. And it is a youth theater festival. Um, and it's kind of the opposite of Paprika, where instead of the art that's being made, being made by young people, they actually recast the entire staff of the theater. Um, and every theater position is taken over by a young person for oh. a festival. So like every single theater, like, like the box the office admin. manager, the marketing manager, the bar staff, every person is taken oh, over by a young very person. Very cool. Top to bottom. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, it's a very cool festival. And so I went there as sort of an exchange. Um, so I was telling them about our festival. They were telling me about theirs. I was there during the festival, which was really great. And I took the time while I was there to do a bit of a research trip around the northeast side of the country um, and a little bit into Scotland because they... In England, youth theater is a really unique and different thing than it is in Canada. In particular, it's because they don't really um, theater training in public schools. That's not uh, as common a thing as it is here. It's not part of the curriculum. And so, so youth are a really huge and important resource for professional arts organizations. So all of these professional institutions have massive youth theater programs, like um, just would blow your mind. And at that time, self a director, um, because what I was doing was writing plays, um, very occasionally performing in them, um, and then creating opportunities for young people and old people and community members to perform on stage. So I was doing a lot of community arts work um, and I loved it and I was so into it, but it, it, um, it didn't strike me as directing because it, was, it felt like facilitation really more than anything. Yeah. And when I got into conversations with these folks in England, they all said to me, without uh, exception, well, so you're a director. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not really a director. Like I, you know, I help craft these community based performances and community members. And they were like, well, that's directing. 
And I was like, well, no, but they're not professional. And they were like, right, that's still directing. <laughs> um, because in England is part of a director's journey, like that you would always do a ton of community arts work and a ton of youth engagement work before starting to work professionally or alongside working professionally, because that's part of what culturally it means to be an artist there. Yeah. Um, Oh. And it was just a real eye-opening experience for me because I thought, oh, well, then I guess I am a director. And I started to look at those skills and realize them in the context of what I understood directing to. Be. And it's really kept me, um, I have forever remembered that because it's the reason why I got into directing. And that's a huge part of my artistic identity now. Wow. That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was really crazy. It was a, a really wonderful trip. And and uh, the exchange was really positive that they, they learned a lot about, they learned a lot about them and it was really valuable. Yeah, but also, yeah, and finding out that, you know, you're like, you have the talent of a director, but you never, you could be, and then suddenly you're like, oh, I'm, I'm already doing the thought I would, was never a part of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a real sort of shift in my perspective, for sure. I love that. What advice would you give someone who's like interested in multiple roles in theater? Uh, Not just like multiple roles within creating theater, but also I want to, you know, admin. Yeah, versus, yeah, yeah. Yeah, versus actually doing theater and shows and creative work. Admin is doing theater. So I, I will say that. Yeah. Um, producing is a creative task um, and arts administration is a creative task and anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong um, and short-sighted so to make theater work requires an army of people um, with a huge army of skills and i feel very lucky to have a career that has been so multifaceted mm. i find uh, i get bored really easily so i really like that I sometimes and I write sometimes and I write grants sometimes and I do budget sometimes and I teach classes sometimes. Um, that is what I think makes me good at all of those jobs is because they inform one another in this sort of symbiotic way. And so the opportunity to practice my practice um, as an artist while also contributing to that practice as a producer and as an educator um, I think ha is is so rich. It is exactly why I think I have anything useful to offer. Um, in terms of advice that I would give, sometimes there are artists in the world who you will encounter who have less holistic approach to art making. So however they first meet you is how they will think of you forever. And that can be a bit difficult. So I know that there are certain artists who only think of me as a playwright or only think of me as a director. Um, and it can be really hard to break out of those patterns. Uh, so that to me just means that you have to do an even better job of communicating who you are and your identity. But that that can be a bit difficult sometimes. Um, so that's the only advice I would give is to just make sure that you introduce yourself first the way you want them to know you um, and uh, and make sure that you allow that to be your entry point and that you continue to do expansion of who you are. Cool. I hope we get to a point where, you know, being such a multifaceted artist is, you know, the norm and what's expected and what's- Well, and we are, we really are getting yeah, to that yeah. point. I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of how people accept it too. Totally. Yeah. And that's where the, that's where the change needs to happen. But we are getting to a point, I think, where you're seeing a lot more artists who act as producers and a lot more artists who produce themselves and a lot more, more artists and a lot, you know, I think that that is really rich. And it means that when you're collaborating with people, you're not only collaborating with them in their current role, you are also collaborating with them in all of the past roles that they have previously assumed. And that's for any room because it's going to be more ideas uh, rather than less. What's a trend that you just can't get behind? Sweatpants every day. I just don't, I've never been a person who can do that. And I know that that's what everyone is loving about working from 
home, but I put on real pants every day because otherwise I can't, I just can't do it. What is a piece of media that you would talk about for hours? The Golden Girl. Oh, I actually never watched <laughs> oh, it. Oh, it's my favorite. It's the absolute best. You know, uh, there are episodes that you have to skip because then, you know, you get, you're like, oh, there's just a lot of like racism here. Uh -huh. That happens for sure. But I would argue that for the most part, what I love about it is that it was unbelievably progressive for its time. And by putting these progressive ideas in the voices of older women, um, they were able to actually put them out on on air without them being censored. And so wow. um, I really love the show for that reason. And uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous piece of TV history. What do you wish you could see more of in theater? Mm, uh, I wish I could see more queer stories on stage. Um, I wish that I could also see a greater uh, acceptance of, um, I'll say it in a different way, less of a division between what is considered entertaining and what is considered serious. Um, I think that those kinds of divisions are useless. And I think that comedy can be really fun and really meaningful. And I think I'm that serious. <laughs> be really fun and really meaningful. And I think that musical theater has lots to say. And, you know, I, I think sometimes in theater, we can create some silos or put up some fences where there don't need to be um, fences just so that we can sort of feel stuffy or knowledgeable about something. And I think that all of that's a bit useless. And I, I definitely fell into that trap a few times, but I think I'm more in a space now where I hope we can build one another up and celebrate each other's successes and what each other are doing um, rather than quick to judge it um, artistically. I love that. What's your favorite memory from your time at Paprika? Yeah, well, okay, if you want a specific one. Yeah, let's say a specific one. My absolute favorite memory from a time at Paprika is I, I used to executive each year on a mystery road trip that they didn't get to know where we were going or what we would have instructions and a time. And, and best one was one that happened when I... I <laughs> I rented a car and I drove us to Niagara Falls at like eight o'clock at night because Niagara Falls is open 24 hours a day. Yeah. And so we just had this like uproariously good time in Niagara Falls um, oh. overnight on like a Tuesday. It was pretty <laughs> hilarious. So that's that's probably my favorite paprika memory are those um, silly road trip. I love that. <laughs> What is the worst piece of advice you've ever been given? It was once given the piece of advice that I should try to write for a specific opportunity so that I should, you know, write a play that would make the most sense at Summer Works and write a play for this given theater and, and try to write with a, a, a sort of end goal in mind. And never have I written so many terrible plays. What's a question that you hate being asked? Favorites. Anytime that someone asks me, like, what's your favorite play or what's your favorite musical or what who's your favorite playwright any of those favorite questions just because there are too many I couldn't possibly pick one what would your perfect day look like you know what I had my perfect day last year on January 4th I saw I was in New York visiting a very old and good friend of mine and uh I I saw the inheritance um by Matthew Lopez, which is um, a like six and a half hour show that's in two wow. parts. Wow. And I saw it all in one day. And uh, there is something about being in a theater space for something that is such an event that there's so much time elapsed while you're participating in it that feels like you have to you have to really want it. It feels a bit like a marathon, like you're really going for something. I know you're just sitting there doing nothing, but like you're really invested in it for that long. And um, I've been to a few sort of long duration shows like that uh, oh. in my life. And I always find the experience really exciting because it is so rare that I get to say, you know, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm going to the theater. I'm going to a play after dinner. Or after work, I'm going to, like, I see, you know, in a normal year, about 100 shows a year. Um, but that show, 
and any show where I'm sort of investing my whole day in the experience of someone else's art, um, I think is a really fun and awesome way to spend a day. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely gonna do it now. <laughs> what is one piece of advice you share with something to participate? Hmm. I have a few like catchphrases that have come up in my teaching over again. I think the biggest one that I would, and I think is true for both writing and directing and performing to some extent, I don't believe that there should be a mirror to real life. Uh, and no one would like to watch my real life. I think theater sh should always be the greatest hits of real life. Um, and the idea of giving us the juiciest parts of the story or the parts that are going to make you think the most or that's really where the the theater lies and so to worry about something being realistic worry about it being profound and powerful that's great advice good great i'm glad yeah. <laughs> wouldn't it be if i just like said something shit there uh and then you were like oh <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. And then like we cut that from the interview. No, that was great advice because, you know, sometimes I uh, I go into this idea of, um, I, what was I going to say? I'm, I'm totally just thinking about the, the thing you said now. Um, but sometimes you really go into the, like wanting to make something, uh, well, sorry, I'm blanking completely. That's okay. <laughs> That's totally okay. We're on Zoom and it's weird. It's totally... It's yeah, totally what fun. was the last thing you said about, you know... Just theater our... being the greatest hits of real life. Yeah, and oh, the realistic thing too. Yeah. Like sometimes you're too concerned with how's the audience gonna, you know, make sense of this. But sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't have to make sense. Like it's just... They're gonna connect well, the dots. That's why they come to the show. They want to do some work too. You don't need yeah, to give it all away. Exactly. I always think also with like... I work with a lot of young artists who are really interested in something that is uber realistic because that's what you see in film and TV a lot. And I would rather you tell me that something is a kitchen than showing me an actual kitchen. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really, you know, if your budget only allows for like four chairs and a red balloon, then, then use four chairs and a red balloon instead of, making a crappy version of whatever the realistic thing would be. Yeah, totally. You're right. It's good. Believe in the audience's imagination, like trust the audience. Or, exactly. Yes. yes. That's the advice. Trust the audience. They're, they're, <laughs> they're there for a reason. And it's to, it's to be a part of the show. So you don't have to, you don't have to give them all the information. Let them, let them meet you halfway. Where do you see the future of theater? Or what do you see the future of theater being? I think what I love about theater is the ephemeral nature of the shared experience. So the fact that a number of people are experiencing the same thing in, and that they, it will never be replicated. That feels magic to me. Like there is, you know, dust in the air and then it disappears and you can't ever grab it again. And all of my strongest memories as a theater goer are, are because I felt something with the people who I was watching the performance with mm -hmm. rather than just experiencing it on my own. Yeah. And so I think the future of theater must continue to build community where there is not previously community, must continue to tell stories where there have not previously been stories, and must retain the elements that make it live and essentially ephemeral. Mm -hmm. I think theater is best when it knows what it is, which is not film. Yeah, <laughs> and I do agree. <laughs> I love film but I love it for a whole series of different reasons than I love theater. And so when we try something that we are not, we will inevitably fail. But when we try to be what we are, 
in new and innovative ways, we will inevitably succeed. This year, shifting to digital content um, has been a real joy for me, as long as I don't think of it as a stopgap. It has to be about a new adventure in the same way that I pursue every project with a newness and I don't bring baggage with me. Um, so I think the future of theater will probably have a lot more digital access, which is really awesome. I think the future of theater will probably have a lot more hybrid forms, which is really awesome. And I also think that the future of theater will still involve a group of strangers sitting in a dark room together for an extended period of time because they wanna have that experience of community. And that need to connect is greater now than it ever has been. Um, and I think, and I hope that we will value that need to connect more coming out of a pandemic. Yeah. You really said it well, the love aspect of theater is like, and the fact that you can't, it's like in the moment, moment that you can never have that feeling and, and what happened on stage is all that's ever gonna happen and you're never gonna have to be able to redo it or rewatch it or relive it. It, it really is magical. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. This was so fabulous. Now I'd like to do the opposite where I get to interview you. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate I really appreciate the chance to chat about a festival that I love so much and that I think does such great things. And and I'm really happy to hear that you are experiencing that right now. And and I'm really excited for what the 20th anniversary will bring. Mm -hmm.